I've had the opportunity to talk about nucleic acids in previous tutorials and even do one specifically on DNA, I think it's time to do one on RNA as well because these molecules are very, very important in life. So without these, you will not see life on Earth as we know it. So RNA stands for ribonucleic acid, as I just wrote up there to save some time and now what I'm writing is that this is a macromolecule essential for life and is a nucleic acid. First thing to know about RNA. Another thing that you should know about these molecules is that they are usually single-stranded. Like we've seen in DNA that is usually present in the double-stranded form, the ladder-shaped form that I mentioned with two, um, two strands of nucleotides. Here you're usually going to see just only one strand of nucleotides. That's why single-stranded. And as I also written here that these molecules are comprised of these monomers, the nucleotides. The first thing I want to talk about RNA as well is that the monomers that comprise this polymer or this long molecule are called nucleotides. And I've talked about nucleotides in previous uh, tutorials, especially the one on nucleic acids that you can have a look and you can get an idea, a better description of nucleotides, but I'm going to review it quickly. It's a base with a pentose and a phosphate. This is what I call a nucleotide. And if I draw it for you, it is going to look kind of like this. So you have one phosphate, two, three. This is the maximum capacity of a nucleotide the maximum phosphate groups you can find in a nucleotide. Then you have a, a pentose in the middle and the base on the other side, bound to the carbon number one, if you remember well. This is my pentose here. And the difference, the major difference between RNA and DNA is that the nucleotides, the monomers of RNA are different than than the ones found in DNA. Why they're different? Because the pentose sugar here is a ribose, meaning that you find two hydroxyl groups here. So two. In DNA, in carbon number two actually, you find that the hydroxyl group here is not found in DNA. So there is one, you actually find a hydrogen and not a hydroxyl group, an OH group. So DNA doesn't, well, um, use better English here. So DNA doesn't have this OH group or this hydroxyl group. So one less oxygen in DNA. This is the major difference in this monomer in RNA. So now it's time to talk about this area here, the bases found in nucleotides of RNA or the RNA nucleotides. And there are two types of bases, of course, that I explained in nucleotides, the purines and pyrimidines. And the purines in, in RNA, if you can guess, same ones you find in DNA is the adenine and the guanine. So these are the purines found in the nucleotides of RNA. I'm going to put letters, give letters, because that's usually how you find them, simplified. For pyrimidines, you find time, no, not timing. You are going to say it, but no, 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 it's not timing. It's cytosine that is also found in DNA, C, but instead of timing, you find uracil. That's the one that kind of substitutes thymine found in DNA. And you, instead, you find uracil in the nucleotides of RNA. And for lack of a better word, I'm just going to say substitutes the, the thymine from the DNA. This is for a lack of a better word. So you can get an idea, and you're going to see the processes where or the the changes where you go from DNA to RNA and how the 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 uracil will substitute the thymine found in DNA when you're going to mRNA for example but we're going to talk about that later meanwhile about the hydrogen bonds 
that you can also find in RNA, even though it's single-stranded, adenine will bind with two bonds to uracil instead of thymine that you find in DNA, and guanine is going to bind with three hydrogen bonds to cytosine. So this is a very important structure found in DNA, uh, sorry, RNA molecules, self-complementary hairpins or stem loops. You're going to see that in a lot of RNA molecules. That's why I need to talk and give you an idea of what these uh, structures are and why are they self-complementary. Why do I mean by self-complementary? And the, imagine this is my single-stranded RNA molecule that I have here. And what happens usually is that this molecule is able to kind of fold on itself, like single-stranded, not like DNA. In DNA, you would see another strand right here, kind of like a ladder. I'm going to just draw. So this is double-stranded DNA, and this is my kind of with my bases here. I'm just going to draw my bases here. This is my single-stranded RNA molecule here and DNA here, so you can have an idea. But anyway, so it folds into itself, and because you have the, the bases on this area here, for example, have a some bases here. For example, if you have an adenine here, a guanine, random, I'm just doing it randomly, an adenine, a guanine, and a cytosine on one side, and on the other side, coincidentally, you will have a, a uracil, a cytosine, and a guanine. And what happens, as you know, these bases are complementary to each other. When they find each other, they say, hey, let's form hydrogen bonds between each other. And so this is what's going to happen. Adenine is going to form two bonds here with the uracil, the guanine and cytosine, three bonds, and the cytosine again and the guanine, another three bonds. And this is how you bind, this is what we mean by self-complementary, the same molecule of RNA is going to bind with the other, another side when it forms this loop. This is what we mean by self-complementary binding. And then it forms this structure that kind of looks like a hairpin or a stem loop. That's why they, they gave these names to this shape of my RNA molecule. Okay, so this is what I mean. I'm going to write here if you want to have a nice description is when the strand folds and forms because I know how these important you have to have some some written knowledge or a nice way to put these things in medical school or other other classes so I'm going to write out another section I know it's, it might be a little bit boring, but I guess it's worth having something to write down and to memorize the same strand. Okay, this is what we mean by self-complementary hairpin structures found in RNA. I want to do two things here with this slide. The first one is use an image of this molecule here that is called tRNA. And this is a very important molecule in translation where you go from our mRNA molecule to the protein, but we're going to talk about that later on when I have an actual tutorial explaining translation to you. But right now what I want to do is to explain or relate or giving, give you a, an example of the self-complementary hairpins on RNA molecules. And when you look at this, this actually looks like the same structure you find in DNA, the double-stranded shape or the, the ladder shape that you find in DNA. But this is not the case. What you actually see here, if you follow this molecule to the end from one extremity, and go all the way to the other extremity, this is one single strand, only one molecule of RNA. But what happens is when it bends, some bases, since they're uh, complementary to each other, they're going to form the hydrogen bonds, the H bonds here. And this is what we mean by self-complementary. The same molecule is, bind, is going to bind 
when it folds to another structure. And this is the hairpin structure and stem loop. So you have an example of a real case example of uh, where you can find hairpins in RNA. Another thing I would like to talk about is examples of importances of these structures, of the hairpins and stem loops. One example is the first one I have here. I just wrote it down because it would take a long time if I wrote down, but I want you to have a written um, explanation so you can copy down if you need for your notes or anything else. So the first example I want to give is termina termination sequence in prokaryotes. And what happens is the during transcription, the polymerase meets this loop, the hairpin loop, and falls off and transcription ends. So this is one importance. The second importance is tRNA, this molecule you see here. Protein synthesis has three hairpin loops, as you can see, one, two, and three here. And one is called anticodon. And the one I'm talking about, this anticodon here, is this area here. It's usually comprised of three nucleotides and is the area where it recognizes mRNA molecule. So and you're going to understand this in more detail when I have a, um, a tutorial on translation. But right now I just want you to have an idea of the importance of hairpins and stem loops. From now on to the end of this tutorial, I want to do something that makes sense, which is you know that DNA is definitely your genetic material. So where you find the information for the color of your eyes, your height, anything that physically defines you. But what is RNA? Where can you find RNA? This is the biggest question. I actually, the first thing when I studied this, I questioned myself, what is RNA? Where do you find it? What is the importance? And to do that, I'm going to clarify it by just doing a very simple thing. I'm going to run through the, the types of RNA that you can find in your cell. And you there in this way, you can have an idea of where you can find this molecule or the importance of this molecule in your cells. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do or the first type of RNA I'm going to talk about is mRNA. And this is probably one of the most famous, let's say, forms of RNA, and it stands for messenger RNA. And the word says it all. This is a messenger function. And what happens, this is the template of protein synthesis. I have the definitions here written, pre-written for you, so you can take notes uh, take it to class, take it to your exam, but these are the notes I usually take in classes and also from the books and and so you can have an idea and I will save your time as well. So this is a template of protein synthesis and carries information about a protein sequence to the ribosomes. And what do I mean by this? So you have your DNA as a genetic material. This is the coding. And it's in your nucleus, it's there, it's uh, peaceful there with all that information. But then you have to carry, you have to have a messenger form to go from the DNA and reach protein, which is your final product. And proteins are uh, the building structures that you see in your body. So the color of your hair, your height, your cells, they're all made of these great, great uh, molecules, the proteins. Uh, so to go from DNA to protein, this is, by the way, a very simplified way <laughs> to talk about proteins, but I will talk about it in more detail in other tutorials, I can promise you that. But anyway, when you go from DNA, you're, you're, the information information, the coded information about a protein, you have to have a messenger. And the messenger is going to be RNA. And mRNA will carry that messenger to the ribosomes, which are these structures that are able to convert that message into the protein. And we're going to talk about also later um, when we talk about translation. Another type of RNA that you find is rRNA, which stands for ribosomal, ribosomal RNA, ribonucleic acid. So, and these are 
components of ribosomes, those, uh, I have the definition here. Again, I'm not writing this in real time, so you won't get bored. The ribosome binds to mRNA and carries out protein synthesis. This is like a structure, it kind of looks like this, if you, if you see it, it looks like this. Two subunits, at least in, uh, in eukaryotes, that you will run your mRNA molecule and form your protein, kind of looking like this. This The red area, the red structures, are my ribosomes. And in prokaryotes, you will find different rRNAs with different sizes. And the sizes here are described in an S. When you hear the S, a sum number and an S, this is a unit called well, my Swedish friends, especially Matthias, hopefully I'm not butchering, it's Vedberg. Hopefully I did not butcher the name of the, the, the very important man who, who did, who has his name associated to this unit. And Vedberg means that is a sedimentation unit. So sedimentation unit. And it's used to describe the sizes, the different sizes of rRNAs found in ribosomes. And in prokaryotes, as you know, prokaryotes also have ribosomes. They have these three types of uh, um, rRNAs with these uh, sizes. So you have 5, 16, 23. And I'm t writing it down because they are important. Some professors do uh, require you to know these numbers. And for eukaryotes or for your cells, uh, you have a 5S, 5.8S, 18, and 28S rRNA. So uh, four types or four sizes for, or four different types of uh, rRNAs in your ribosomes. Uh, this or these RNAs are actually the component or the catalytic um, component of your ribosomes where these are involved, what I mean by catalytic, are involved in reactions in your ribosomes and the reactions that are going to happen in the ribosomes is when you have your R mRNA going through and converting it, let's say, into protein. So these are the reactions going on on ribosomes, and this is where you're going to see the rRNA, the ribosomal rRNA. So this is another type of RNA, and I mentioned it before, tRNA, and it's, uh, it stands for transfer, so transfer RNA. And the word says it all like it usually does, transfer, meaning that this is going to be involved in that part, the DNA, when you go from DNA to mRNA to protein. It's going to be involved somewhere in the last part when you go from mRNA to protein in translation. And what it does, as you know, you have three molecules here called anticodon. This area here is called the anticodon. And it's going to bind, recognize a sequence in mRNA. And since you have a, an amino acid attached here somewhere, or you're going to have it later on the reaction, it's going to attach or bind that uh, amino acid into an ongoing polypeptide chain. So imagine that you're forming a protein here. So this is the importance and the, the function of this molecule of tRNA, another type of RNA, and you can see how important for, uh, you are probably seeing by now, uh, since I've spoken about so many molecules, or I'm going to talk about a, a couple more uh, that actually um, have extreme importance in your cells. And so keep in mind that this carries the amino acids and transfers a specific amino acid to a growing polypeptide chain at the ribosomes. So this is happening at the ribosomes uh, side of protein synthesis during translation, another thing that we're going to talk about later. 
another thing that is important to know about tRNA is that these are small RNA chains, so it's about 80 nucleotides, so not that big when compared to other RNA molecules, but you have an idea of what tRNA is, and keep in mind because this is an important molecule for later on tutorials. Now, I just have one little thing to say about these two types of RNA, pre-mRNA and pre-rRNA. Uh, as we spoke about messenger RNA and ribosomal RNA, the pre-molecules are just precursors uh, or RNA molecules. There are precursors of the mature forms of uh, mRNA and rRNA. So mature, they're precursors to mature mRNA and rRNA. And you can see them in these processes uh, later on. Uh, you can clearly see them where they're going to be. Uh, usually when you go from DNA, I'm going to give you an example. When you go from DNA to mRNA, this is the mature form uh, of uh, mRNA. Usually there are some processes here involved that will form a precursor and the precursor is called the M or the pre mRNA. So this is an example to, of these two forms I wanted to talk about and mention them in this tutorial because they're important to know and you have to have an idea and a background about these two types of RNA as well. Now I want to talk about a subtype of RNAs, the non-coding coding RNAs, as the name indicates, and C RNAs. And if why are they non-coding? And I want to explain you why. If you look at mRNAs, the previous ones I talked about, or tRNA, transfer RNA, they all, in a way, carry some sort of code in them. These molecules have sequences there that have a code or are responsible for coding something. And in the example, for example, of uh, mRNA, two examples, I'm seeing example, example all the time, but mRNA, you go from DNA to protein, right? And this messenger RNA is carrying a code. So this is why I mean by coding, they have a code. Also, tRNA, when we look that the anti or anticodon has a code there that will bind to the mRNA molecule. So there is a code there as well. So these are coding molecules. They have codes in them. And these RNAs that we're going to talk about now, they do not carry any codes or any coding information. But they do play important roles in your cells. Keep that in mind. Um, just because they do not carry the, that, um, that, that code information, they still are important. And some of them are called regulatory RNA, and they play major roles in regulation of gene expression, so very important right there. The first one I'm going to talk about is snRNA, also known as small nuclear or a short for small nuclear RNAs, and these RNAs are involved in modifying other RNA molecules, okay? And the functions, I'm going to give you three walk through three quick functions of these small nuclear RNAs that keep in mind or keep write them down because they're quite important. And you're going to talk about small uh, nuclear RNAs when we see them in other tutorials. So in RNA splicing, for example, you see small nuclear RNAs and they 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 help in the removal of introns from the pre mRNA. And what do I mean by that? So when we're going from, again, from DNA to the protein, you have the messenger RNA. This is the transcription going on. And there is a precursor that we also talked about, the pre-mRNA. 
And this precursor is not the mature form of the molecule. So the mRNA is the mature, the last product, let's say, of the mRNA pro uh, process or the transcription. So in order to go for the pre-mRNA, you have to remove these areas uh, of the molecule called introns, and they do not code for anything, for any of the amino acids, so they need to be kicked out. And what happens is a process called RNA splicing, and we're going to look at it uh, later on. And the, the small nuclear rRNAs are definitely involved in the removal of those introns in pre-mRNA, so keep that in mind. Another thing to know, the second thing to know, is regulation of transcription factor or RNA polymerase. Again, this is a replication, DNA replication that we are going to talk about, but keep in mind that S and RNAs are definitely involved. And another thing they're involved is in maintaining telomeres, or what are telomeres, you can ask. These are sequences at the end of your chromosomes that do not uh, code for anything. They're long sequences of nucleotides. They do not code for any of your, your proteins or for any of your amino acids. But they are important because these ends of the chromosomes, the telomeres, like the name indicates, telo ends of your chromosomes protect the chromosomes from being deteriorated. So very important structure. And small nuclear RNAs are involved in maintaining these telomeres, and we're going to learn about that as well later. Another type of non-coding RNAs are these SNO RNAs, and they stand or they're short for small nuclear RNAs. And you saw before, previously, small nuclear. Now you have something slightly different, small nucleolar. And why are they nucleolar, not nucle nuclear? Because we are talking about a different structure here. The previous ones are found in the nucleus, but these ones, these small nuclear DNAs, are actually found in the nucleus as well, but inside of a particular structure found in the nucleus that you have probably heard about, the nucleolus. So, and I'm trying, what I did here, it's a very bad drawing of a eukaryotic cell, and I have my nucleus here, this uh, larger circle here, and inside I have my nucleolus. This is where it is. And this is where I find my small nuclear RNAs, and they're definitely essential role, they're essential role in uh, RNA biogenesis. This is what they do. And they do this by guiding chemical modifications of ribosomal RNAs, the rRNAs that I talked about previously. So the these are involved in, in modifications of the rRNAs and also other RNA genes like the transfer RNA and a small nuclear RNA as well. And as I mentioned previously, these are located in the nucle nucleolus. And why? Because nu the nucleolus is a site for RNA or site of. I prefer to use a little bit better English, even though it's my second language. Site of RNA synthesis. This is where RNA is being synthesized and therefore these need to be present here, the small nuclear RNAs, if they're going to be present or they're going to guide these chemical modifications of ribosomal RNAs and RNAs in general. So that's why they need to be there. SIRNAs are another type of uh, non-coding RNAs, and the SI stands for small interference RNAs. So interference, just want to make sure I'm spelling it correctly, small interference RNAs, and they're not 
big molecules. They're between 20 and 25 nucleotides. So when you compare it to other RNA molecules, you can clearly see they're not um, humongous. But in any case, I want to be brief about these this type of molecules because I could go on and on and even have enough material to do another tutorial on RNA interference because this is the process that uh, where you find siRNA, small interference RNA, um, and what happens here is when a RNA molecule interferes with the expression of a specific gene. This is what happens in RNA interference, and to say that si or small interference RNA molecules are involved in this process. Telomerase RNA is definitely another type of non-coding RNA and what it does, do not get confused though with this, with a function, but a telomerase is the enzyme that, I'm going to draw an enzyme here, this is not beautiful, but say this is my enzyme here, and this is the enzyme that is going to add the telomeres to my chromosomes, so say if this is a chromosome, this is I'm not a very good artist, but I'm going to do my best. This is a chromosome. and Say that I have a telomere here, which is a sequence. Uh, it's definitely, it definitely doesn't look like this, but you can get an idea that these are the ends of my chromosomes and, um, or my telomeres. And a tel telomerase is definitely the enzyme that is going to build these telomeres. And the telomeres are, like I mentioned previously, these protect the chromosomes from being deteriorated by the environment. So, and one thing that is important to know about telomerase RNA is that you find uh, parts or molecules of D RNA, sorry, so I'm gonna say this is my molecule of RNA here, that serve as templates for building the ends of eukaryotic chromosomes, but do not confuse this for the fact that they serve as templates. Do, they're not coding for anything. They're still non-coding uh, RNAs because, as you know, the telomeres are not uh, coding for anything. They're parts uh, of the chromosomes, but they definitely do not code for anything. And they are nucleotides, but they do not follow any sequence uh, or codes to any amino acid or protein. So keep that in mind. That's why you still say that telomerase RNA is uh, found in the, the telomerase and is going to serve as a template to build these telomeres, but they're still non-coding. These are is or is short for micro RNAs. And again, I'm going to be very brief on the description of these types of RNAs, but so you can have an idea for later on. But what they are, they're short RNA molecules found in eukaryotes or eukaryotic cells. And they are involved in post-transcriptional regulators, or they are tra uh, post-transcriptional regulators that bind to complementary sequences on target mRNAs. So when you look at that part of the DNA going to protein, okay, DNA containing all the genes that code for a certain protein or different proteins, and in the middle, you're going to have where you are going to form the messenger RNA that carries the information to produce uh, the protein in translation. But what happens here is these miRNAs, microRNAs, usually what they do is they bind to sequences of the mRNA here. So I'm going to right here, the mRNA here, they, the miRNAs will bind here, miRNAs, and what they do is they can result in translation repression, uh, meaning that it will not go from this part, from the mRNA to protein, so this part here is going to be repressed, so it can result in that or in target degradation. It will degradate the mRNA molecule um, at that target uh, targeted sequence. And you can see that in later uh, tutorials or even look at that in more detail in your books. Uh, but in general, this is what it means, translation repression or target degradation. 
Another thing they can do is uh, doing this, the same process with the miRNAs, they can silence a gene or they can cause gene silencing. And gene silencing is a very simple, well, it's not a simple process, but it's another way to say switching off. So switching off of a certain gene, so no expression, so no expression of a gene. And this can happen if you have the gene coded in the DNA and then it moves on to the normal process, the transcription to an mRNA molecule and you have it bound to an miRNA or a microRNA molecule it will switch off the gene because it will not be able to go from the mRNA to the protein stage. So there is no translation. And this is called also switching off or gene silencing. A quick word on ribozymes to let you know that these are also RNA molecules. Or you can categorize them as types of molecules, RNA molecules. And as you've probably seen by now, and if you look at the name, you can see that the last part is zymes. And by zymes, we're talking about RNA molecules that are able to have enzymatic functions, or they can be enzymes or function as enzymes. So, and enzymes, as you probably heard before in basic biology, enzymes are involved in catalyzing reactions. Okay, so ribozymes are simply RNA molecules that function as enzymes or are able to catalyze reactions. Simple, simple, simple. And why are they able to catalyze reactions? That's the, the important part, is because they have something called tertiary structure. And by tertiary structure of a molecule, for example, when I talk about primary structure, I am talking about the line a molecule with no bonds except the ones between the monomers. So it's a long line looking like an, a necklace with only bonds between uh, the monomers. And if we talk about RNA, I'm talking about the phosphodiester bonds between uh, the nucleotides. So this is what I mean by primary structure. <clears throat> Sorry. When I start forming bonds between these monomers, I will go and form a secondary structure, but I'm not going to talk about that secondary structure. I will talk about the tertiary structure when you keep forming bonds and more bonds and more bonds until you get a, a 3D structure, like this is my 3D structure, I'm a great artist, but like the structures you see when you Google a molecule, that very complex uh, structure, 3D structure, that's what I mean by tertiary structure. And why are, are, is this structure important for the function or the enzymatic function that ribozymes have? Because by assuming this, this structure, this type of structure, they are able to see a molecule and interact with them and uh, they have space in them to interact with a molecule and catalyze reactions okay this is why it's important because if they they were just having like this primary structure here it would be more difficult to interact with another molecule and and um, and and function as uh, and catalyze a reaction okay so keep that in mind and we're going to talk about later on about tertiary structures and and 3d structures and the the importance in reactions but right now have an idea if the professor asks you why is important you say it's a tertiary structure uh, which enables enables it to catalyze a chemical reaction, okay? Now, a quick note on functions of ribozymes, very quick note. Uh, the first thing they're involved in is autosplicing of RNA. And our autosplicing means that they're going to hydrolyze phosphodiester bonds. And they can either hydrolyze their own phosphodiester bonds or even hydrolyze other molecules' phosphodiester bonds. And these are the bonds between the nucleotides that I talked about. So these are the bonds that I'm talking about that they're able to hydrolyze. The second word I want to, or the second function is RNA cleavage. And there are a lot of processes where RNA cleavage is important um, and the name says it all. 
so there, it, and these ribozymes are going to definitely be involved in some of these processes. The third function that I want to talk about is peptide bond formation. And this happens during translation. I had, I've talked about translation a couple of times in this tutorial, if, if I'm not wrong. And it, this is when you go from mRNA, so messenger RNA, to protein. Okay, when you are forming your final product, your protein, and well, it's not final product, but very generalistically speaking, this is uh, the the last step, let's say, in in uh, when you're going from DNA to protein, and here ribozymes are going to play a function or a role. They, they will catalyze aminotransferase, and aminotransferase is this enzyme that will be helping uh, the bond formation between, um, between the amino acids to the ongoing polypeptide chain, okay? Uh, you're going to see that in much more detail, but just have an idea that ribozymes play a major role in catalyzing the aminotransferate activity, and this is going on on ribosomes, on those little um, factories, uh, protein factories that you find in your cells.